Well, good morning, church. Good to see you this morning. Let me encourage you to open your Bibles with me to Revelation chapter 19. Revelation 19. And as you're making your, your way there, let me just encourage you with as much confidence as you can muster at 9 o'clock in the morning to say, Jesus is coming back. Jesus is coming back. Yes, he is. And that's where we find ourselves this morning in our verse-by-verse -verse study through the book of Revelation. And I've got to tell you, when Pastor Neil asked me to teach Revelation 19, I really felt like I'd won the lottery. <laughs> I did. I mean, if you've been here over the past several weeks, you know the kind of science fiction stuff that we've been through. So I'm really thankful this morning that God spared me from teaching through one of those chapters. For instance, I, I could have drawn the stinging locust from chapter 9. Some of you may have seen this graphic. Some people say, well, those, those locusts are modern-day helicopters. It, it could be. This correlates the human faces, the horse bodies, the lion's teeth, and the armor made of iron. I'm not saying I buy into the whole helicopter thing, but I did have an interesting conversation with my nephew about the idea. And that's not something you typically talk to your nephew about. But my nephew's kind of special in that regard. His name's Eric. And Eric was a flight engineer for Bell Helicopters V280 Valor Project. And that's the little brother to the Osprey, if you don't know what that is. And he seemed to agree that either the Valor or the Osprey, we see here locally all the time in our skies, would be a much better fit for what John described as locust in Revelation. But the truth is, we just don't know. John was doing the best he could to describe something he'd never seen before. I also could have been assigned chapter 11. These are the two witnesses. Great guys. They're clothed in burlap. They spit fire and stop the rain. I mean, there's a global burn ban coming, and these guys are the cause of it. Or then there's my personal favorite from Pastor John's message a couple of weeks ago. It reminded me my friend Todd used to own a big red Chevrolet Tahoe. And his family affectionately called it the Big Red Ho. Tahoe. Ho. Well, chapter 17 features the mother of all hoes. The mother of all harlots in Bible speak. Who was also drunk, by the way, and riding a beast with seven heads and ten horns. Now, there's a chapter I don't want. And trust me, you don't want to Google images on that one either. But Revelation 19 is not like any of those. It doesn't have the crazy sci-fi imagery in it. And it's very clearly played out in two specific scenes. It's well organized. Scene one is a massive celebration happening in heaven. As Babylon is utterly destroyed, and we close the door on what we call the Great Tribulation. And then scene two, Jesus is leading his heavenly army to earth to once and for all conquer the forces of darkness and to set up his earthly kingdom. Two scenes in Revelation 19. Now, you may remember back in the introduction to Revelation, in chapter 1, as John is greeting the seven churches, look, John said, he comes with the clouds of heaven, and everyone will see him, even those who have pierced him. And in our time together this morning, we're going to see that statement fulfilled. And listen, the significance of this moment can't be overstated. I mean, this is the destination we've been traveling toward over the previous 18 chapters as we've gone verse by verse through the book of Revelation. Roughly since September 2021, that's when we started all this. 
in our Sunday morning teaching series. And it's not just the climax of a, a book in the Bible, this book, the book of Revelation. It's literally the apex of all of Scripture. It's Jesus Christ returning to the earth. Charles Swindoll gave these biblical facts about that. One out of every 30 verses in the Bible mentions the subject of Christ's return at the end of time. Of the 216 chapters in the New Testament, there are well over 300 references to the return of Christ. 23 of the 27 New Testament books mention his return. In the Old Testament, such well-known and reliable men as Job, Moses, David, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Daniel, as well as the minor prophets mention Christ's return in their writings. Christ often spoke specifically about his own return. And throughout the centuries, Jesus' disciples and followers have adamantly believed and taught that Christ would someday return to earth. I really relate to Calvary pastor Jim Gallagher. You may remember Jim was here fairly recently, did a marriage conference for us, great pastor down in Vero Beach. Listen to his perspective on this. All the prophets prior to John spoke prophetically of this day, when Jesus would return, the Spirit of God stirred them and enlightened them to write about these things that were coming. But John wrote differently, Jim said. You see, John was translated into the future. We don't really understand that, but that's what happened. And he watched the return of Jesus Christ happen before his very eyes. And so John's writing is the record of history. John is writing not so much as a prophet foretelling, but as a historian recording. John is saying, I saw these things happen so I could give this message to the church so the church would know what's coming. So here's the thing. John's not writing about something that he believed might happen in the future. He's writing as someone who, through divine intervention, again, we can't comprehend what that looked like, but he's already witnessed these events as they occurred, and he wrote them down to reveal them to you and I. I mean, that's some heavy morning, heavy Sunday morning stuff, right? Right? I mean, think about that. So here's a test for you. The only test this morning. Our theme as we've been studying through the book of Revelation this fall has been what? Somebody, anybody. It's on the screen. <laughs> I mean, come on. Jesus, full of mercy and justice, right? And again today... As we've seen in just about every chapter, we're going to see both the mercy and the justice of Jesus. I mean, there's mercy for the inhabitants of the earth as Babylon, this corrupt global system and empire of the Antichrist is crushed and the murderers of God's people are finally avenged. Mercy as the time of the wedding feast finally arrives and the church joins with Jesus in the intimacy, the purity, and the holiness that was always intended. And then there's justice. As Jesus returns to the earth in power to rule and to reign, the rider on the white horse who wages a righteous battle against the beast, the kings of the world, and all of their armies. And justice as the beast and his false prophet are finally thrown into the bottomless pit where they belong. It's the return of Jesus Christ. It's a reality that John was allowed to experience 
and to document for the church. And it's an event I believe that you and I should be anticipating and preparing for as we see the day approaching. Do you see the day approaching? Yeah. So let's pray, and we're going to get together and kind of dissect this chapter together. Father God, I don't have a lot of confidence in your messenger this morning, but I have great faith in you. Lord, that you can use anyone, you can use me beyond what I'm capable of to communicate your truth to your people. That's why we're here this morning. That's what's brought us together. Thank you for doing that. And Father, I believe Jesus wants to tell his church something about himself today. So I submit myself to you, and I pray for ears to hear and for minds to understand what your spirit is saying to the church. And we pray that. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 While I'm thinking about it, I was thinking in Jesus' name what Rob said this morning. Didn't these guys do a great job this morning? Yeah. I mean, if ever there was a morning for worship, it's this morning, as you'll see in God's Word. After this, verse 1 in your text, I heard what sounded like a vast crowd in heaven shouting, salvation and glory and power belong to God. His judgments are true and just. He has punished the great prostitute who corrupted the earth with her immorality. He has avenged the murders of his servants. And again, their voices rang out, praise the Lord, and smoke from the city ascends forever and ever. That city, Babylon. After this, John says, and John says that a lot in the book of Revelation. It's just this continual progress of things that he's trying to keep up with and communicate with. So after what? Well, the answer is in the previous chapter, chapter 18, verse 2. Babylon has fallen. That's where we're at. We've talked a lot about the city of Babylon and what it represents in the book of Revelation. Uh, just last week, Pastor John defined Babylon again so we could understand it and kind of take it away with us, what he was talking about. So the question becomes this, is John the author talking about the Roman Empire of his day? I mean, that's one of the options. Or is he talking about the coming empire built by the beast? Another option. Or he could be speaking of a literal city on the river Euphrates. Is he describing the false wide worldwide religion that kind of takes over as the church is removed from the earth? The counterfeit economic system that as John said last week, everybody buys into it because you kind of have to and because we all have these desires for wealth and lust for pleasure and it fulfills those. Or is John describing a social system that says, hey, we're all okay as long as you don't mention the name. You know the name, Jesus. And as we've discussed, the answer is yes, Babylon is all of those things. And John is saying here in Revelation 19 that Babylon in all of its totality has fallen. And great was its fall. When something's repeated in Scripture, it's usually repeated for emphasis. You need to pay attention to those things. And four times in Revelation 18, we're told that Babylon was destroyed in a single day or in a moment, very quickly. And maybe you've experienced this in your life. I mean, one of the Lord's attributes, one that means so much to a misfit like me, is that he's long-suffering with his people. 
I mean, he's been so incredibly patient with me. Just ask my wife, Anna. She's got stories. <laughs> but when judgment comes, and judgment always does, it comes. It comes quickly, and it comes completely. From Pastor John's message last week, verse 21, Then a mighty angel picked up a boulder the size of a huge millstone. He threw it into the ocean, and he shouted, Just like this, the great city Babylon will be thrown down with violence and never be found again. Just like this. I took a lot of notes last week. And here's what I learned about the fall of Babylon. Here are the things I wrote down over and over again. Babylon's fall is sudden. It's complete. And everyone who bought into that system is distraught. I mean, have you ever seen someone so overcome with grief that they're sobbing uncontrollably? They can't hardly breathe, much less talk. They're inconsolable. And that's the picture of those who bought into this corrupt world system after its fall. I mean, they've taken everything they have. They've invested everything in this, this system, and now it's gone. And they're left with nothing. But in many ways, Babylon's fall is the right answer. I mean, it's the answer to the question asked by King David over and over again in the Psalms. It's the question the saints have been asking repeatedly through the centuries. A question that you've likely asked, I've certainly asked it, how long, O oh Lord? How long? Even in this writing, in Revelation chapter 6, as the Lamb broke the fifth seal, John said, I saw under the altar the souls of all who had been martyred for the Word of God and for being faithful in their testimony. They shouted to the Lord and said, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you judge the people who belong to this world, and avenge our blood for what they have done to us. The question is answered in a moment, we're told in Scripture. And immediately following this great sudden fall of Babylon, the party of all parties breaks out in heaven. It's a party celebrating the destruction of Babylon, the ultimate victory of good over evil, and a sure sign that Jesus Christ is returning to the earth. That's a party I want to be a part of. It's the event that celebration itself has grown for for over 2,000 years. And John is witnessing it there firsthand. Shouts of praise ring out from the host of heaven. I believe you and I are going to be there. We're going to be a part of this. And the word used here over and over again is a word you're familiar with. Hallelujah. It means praise the Lord. And the way the word is used here in the original language is, is really an interesting word. The heavenly hosts are certainly saying praise the Lord, but it's also an encouragement, an exhortation to say it again and again. So every time they're saying it, they're saying, say it again, say it again. So here's the scene, the chorus, hallelujah. It's rolling over and over again in heaven. It's like waves of worship and the waves just keep on coming. They never stop. It reminds me of what Paul said in Romans chapter 8. Yet what we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory he will reveal to us later. For all creation is waiting eagerly for that future day when God will reveal who his children really are. Against its will, all creation was subjected to God's curse. But with eager hope, the creation looks forward to the day when it will join God's children in glorious freedom 
from death and decay. For we know that all creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up until the present time. Pastor Neil has some interesting sayings. One that I'm particularly fond of is that we only really have two days, Neil says. We have today, and then we have the day. And what John is seeing here, what he's experiencing in Revelation 19 is the day. It's the day of all days. And listen, just the hope, just the certain expectation that this event will take place, that John somehow was witnessing it in real time and wrote it down to share with us. Man, that should bring us to a greater and a deeper place of worship. Today and every day, it should bring us to a place where we worship God differently, I think. I mean, this should get our hearts pumping if nothing else will. And this party going on in heaven is certainly justified by the fall of Babylon. But listen, the worship, the worship that's happening belongs to the Lord. Commentator Warren Wearsby said this, the song emphasizes God's attributes, which is the proper way to honor him. We do not rejoice at the sinfulness of Babylon or even the greatness of Babylon's fall. We rejoice that God is true and righteous and that he's glorified in his judgments. See, that's what all the worship is about in heaven. And listen, that's the first thing I want you to kind of take away this morning from Revelation 19. As we've worked through Revelation, we've been consistently asking the question, what is Jesus revealing about himself to the church? So number one from our study this morning, and I would encourage you to write it down somewhere. There are going to be four of these. Jesus is worthy of our praise. That's number one. Jesus is worthy of our praise. See, it's either Jesus paid it all or he didn't pay it at all. Can't be both. Jesus is worthy of our praise. Verse 3, and again their voices rang out, praise the Lord, the smoke from the city ascends forever and ever. And the word picture painted here is that the smoke is billowing out of the city nonstop, continuously. I mean, you remember the images of 9-11. It's like the smoke billowing out of New York City, but it never ever ends. Someone used the phrase continued duration. Think about that. Continued duration. That's the, that's the picture we see here of the smoke pouring out of Babylon. But listen, in heaven, in heaven, the party is just beginning. And in verse 4, the heavenly elite join in. Then the 24 elders and the four living beings fell down and they worshiped God who was sitting on the throne. They cried out, amen, praise the Lord. Again, the word hallelujah. The elders representing all of God's people, joint heirs in the kingdom of heaven, rulers with Christ. And these four living beings Four exalted angels whose primary purpose is worship. They're right there too. And from the throne came a voice. Commentator David Guzik said, this voice from the throne of God might be Jesus, but more than likely it's the voice of one of the angels that served at the throne of God. Let me tell you what I think. I think the voice came from God's throne. That's the epicenter of revelation. It's the epicenter of heaven. I think whatever came from there, we need to pay attention to it. And here it is. Praise our God, 
all his servants, all who fear him from the least to the greatest. Scene one, it's a worship service in heaven. It's praising our God and our King for his righteousness and his justice. And everyone is heaven is part of it. Nobody's left out. Then verse six, I heard again what sounded like the shout of a vast crowd or the roar of mighty ocean waves or the crash of loud thunder. John is again trying to describe the indescribable. I mean, it's a crescendo of shouts made by this vast crowd in heaven. He said it's like mighty ocean waves. The sound that they make on our beaches as a hurricane kind of comes around Key West and starts to make its way up into the Gulf. And hallelujah, praise the Lord, we didn't hear those this past season. Not here. Thank you, Lord. Are the crash of loud thunder, John said. And he's describing a, a specific kind of thunder. It's, it's very close, and you not only hear it, but you feel it too. It kind of shudders you, staggers you. Our friend David Guzik said at this point, Revelation approaches the consummation of God's plan for all of history. So we all come to a summit of praise. I love that. Verse 6 continues, Praise the Lord, for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice, and let us give honor to him. For the time has come for the wedding feast of the Lamb, and his bride has prepared herself. She's been given the finest of pure white linen to wear, for the fine linen represents the good deeds of of God's holy people. The wedding feast of the Lamb. Super special occasion. It's the joining of Jesus in his church in the most intimate of relationships. Someone said the closeness of this union is described through the closeness of marriage because nothing else even comes close. Marriage in biblical times was quite different from what most of us would experience today. Today, you may hear marriage expressed as three rings. It's the engagement ring, the wedding ring, and then the suffering. <laughs> You've heard that. <laughs> Actually, it's three events. Excuse me. I'm sorry. Got distracted. It's, it's the engagement, the wedding, and the reception. But in that day, listen, in, in biblical times, in the time that John is writing this, well, listen to how Warren Wearsby describes it. Jewish weddings in that day were quite unlike weddings in the Western world, our weddings today. First, there was the engagement, usually made by the parents of the prospective bride and groom when they were quite young. Arranged marriages were the thing then. The engagement was binding and could be broken only by a form of divorce. Any unfaithfulness during the engagement was considered adultery. When the public ceremony was enacted, the groom would go to the bride's house and he would claim her for himself. He would take her to his home for the wedding supper and the guest would join the couple there. And this feast could last as long as a week. See today what that translates to in our day and age. The church is engaged to Jesus Christ. He's in love with us and we're in love with him. And one day he'll return to take his bride to heaven. We believe that's the rapture, the, the snatching away of the church. And the judgment seat of Christ will come into play. Her works, the church's works will be judged. All her spots and blemishes will be removed. This being complete, the church will be ready to return to the earth with her bridegroom 
at the close of the tribulation to reign with him in glory, the setting up of the kingdom of heaven on earth. And John says the bride, the church, has prepared herself. Like the wise bridemaids in Matthew 25, the expectant church has prepared for the coming of the bridegroom. They've got their lamps lit. They've got plenty of oil waiting. Today we live in the constant expectation of this day. We're in preparation mode right now. But listen, this is significant. She has been given the finest of pure white linen to wear. For the fine linen represents the good deeds of God's holy people. See, you and I, the bride of Christ, the church, we're preparing. We've prepared for this day. But our garments, this fine white linen, clean and bright, representing the good deeds of God's holy people, are given to us. Scripture's very clear. They're given to us through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. See, Jesus makes all things possible because really no one else can. In Revelation chapter 5, the question is asked, who can break the seals on the scroll and open it? And there's anxiety in heaven, if you can imagine that, because they're, they're wondering who's going to break the seals. And then look, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the heir to David's throne, has won the victory. He's worthy to open the scroll and its seven seals. Jesus, our great high priest, our Savior, specializes in doing things that no one else can do. That's what he does. Verse 9, And the angel said to me, write this, Blessed are those who are invited to the wedding feast of the Lamb. And he added, These are true words that come from God. Who's invited to this great and wonderful feast? We are. You and I, church. Those who have believed and received and are in heaven at this time. In John's vision, we're blessed because we've already been cleansed from all of our sins and we're in heaven with Jesus. And listen, we're ready to return to the earth with the Lord at the appointed time. In Matthew 26, Jesus spoke longingly of the day he would drink of the fruit of the vine again with his disciples in the kingdom. That time has come. And the angel says, these are the true words from God. I think we can all understand this. John is a little bit more than overwhelmed at this time. At this point in Revelation 19, all that he's seen and all that he's heard, they're just baffling to him. They're baffling to us. And we're told that he falls down at an angel's feet to worship. But listen to what the angel says. Worship only God, for the essence of prophecy is to give a clear message of Jesus Christ. The essence of prophecy is to give a clear message of Jesus Christ. Now, what's that mean? Well, Bible theologian and prophecy educator John Walvoord said this. This means prophecy at its very heart is designed to unfold the beauty and the loveliness of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And I believe... Jesus wants the church to know that. The second thing I believe Jesus is revealing about himself to the church through his word this morning is that prophecy is ultimately, only, and always about him. Prophecy is about Jesus. Number two, if you're taking notes, write this one down. Jesus is revealing that the essence of prophecy 
is Jesus. That means he's at the very center of it. As Pastor Neil and Pastor John have carefully communicated through this entire study of the book of Revelation, it's not about the churches. It's not about the judgments that we saw. It's not about these insane creatures that are in the book of Revelation or even the battles that we see, as interesting as those things are. Revelation is all about our wonderful Savior, Jesus Christ. It's revealing Jesus to us. And we need to stay focused on him. And that's a beautiful introduction to scene two as we see Jesus, this righteous warrior leading his army into battle and establishing his kingdom upon the earth. So listen, take a really deep breath and join me in verse 11 for scene two. Then I saw heaven opened and a white horse was standing there. Its rider was named Faithful and true for he judges fairly and he wages a righteous war what is jesus revealing about himself to you and i this morning this is number three if you're keeping track jesus is faithful and true Jesus is faithful and true. See, over and over again in Scripture, we're reminded that his faithful love endures forever. David wrote an entire psalm, Psalm 136, if you want to go back and look at it, about the faithfulness of God's enduring love for his people. In Revelation 15, it's the song of Moses and the song of the Lamb. It declares, great and marvelous are your works, O Lord God, the Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of nations. Jesus is faithful and true. What does that mean to you and I today? Well, it means that we can have complete confidence in his promises about the future. That justice will prevail. We can depend on him being the same yesterday, today, and forever. The Bible says there's no shadow of turning in him. Jesus is faithful and true. Verse 12 continues, his eyes were like flames of fire And on his head were many crowns. A name was written on him that no one understood except himself. He wore a robe dipped in blood, and his title was the Word of God. The armies of heaven, dressed in the finest of pure white linen, followed him on white horses. From his mouth came a sharp sword to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron rod. He will release the fierce wrath of God, the Almighty, like juice flowing from a wine press. On his robe at his thigh was written this title, King of all kings and Lord of all lords. And it's interesting to me that the Lord's army is not really suited up for battle the way that I would imagine. At least not as I would see it. I mean, the armor of God, the belt, the breastplate, the shield, the shoes, the helmet, those things that we're given as armor, they're not mentioned here. The mighty weapons of the Lord, we don't see them in this passage. Instead, the army is dressed in the finest of pure white linen, following him on white horses. And I think the key is this. From his mouth came a sharp sword to strike down the nations. From his mouth. In Deuteronomy chapter 1, Moses reminds the children of Israel of something he's already said to them previously. He says, don't be shocked or afraid of them, speaking of an opposing army. 
He says, the Lord your God is going ahead of you. He will fight for you. Just as you saw him do in Egypt. God is faithful. This heavenly army is not your typical heavenly army. Because Jesus is not your typical commander. See, our commander-in-chief goes before us. He's there with us. He even fights the battle for us. See, Jesus is not meeting in Washington, D.C. with his chief advisors discussing strategy. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> He's not safely secluded in a bunker somewhere far away from the front lines or harm's way. The battle belongs to him. He owns it. And he's the one who will fight it. And this is the fourth thing I believe Jesus wants to reveal about himself to the church this morning. The battle belongs to Jesus. The battle belongs to Jesus. And this is going to fly all over some of you guys who saw this as an opportunity to be a mighty, courageous warrior for once in your life, wielding some kind of sword or battle axe or whatever. And I know some of you guys have watched 300 way too many times. <laughs> you got that picture in your mind, just saying. I don't know what this battle is going to look like, what the rules of engagement are going to be, but here's what I do know. We're going to be there, church. Amen. We're going to be with Jesus, and we will be victorious. Amen. We're going to win the battle. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, John said, shouting to the vultures flying high in the sky, come, gather for the great banquet God has prepared. Come and eat the flesh of kings, generals and strong warriors, of horses and their riders, and of all humanity, both free and slave, great and small. In Revelation 19, we have two great feasts that are mentioned. Back in verse 9, we're told, blessed are those who are invited to the wedding feast of the Lamb. That's the one you want to go to. That's the one, get the invitation, you smile really big. And then there's this great banquet God has prepared. And there's a huge difference. The first one, you're a guest of honor. The last one, you're on the menu. <laughs> You're kind of the catch of the day, if you will. <laughs> and then verse 19, Then I saw the beast and the kings of the world, and their armies gathered together to fight against the one sitting on the horse and his army. And the beast was captured, and with him the false prophet who did the mighty miracles on behalf of the beast, miracles that deceived all who had accepted the mark of the beast and who worshipped his statue. Both the beast and his false prophet were thrown alive into the fiery lake of burning sulfur. Their entire army was killed by the sharp sword that came from the mouth of the one riding on the white horse, Jesus. And all the vultures gorged themselves on the dead bodies. That's a happy thought to leave you with. <laughs> so I won't leave you there. Uh, Hebrews 4.12 says this, For the word of God is alive and active. It's sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword, cutting between the soul and spirit, between joint and marrow. It exposes our inner thoughts and our desires. And I don't know if this battle is won simply by a word from the Lord or if there's some semblance of a physical battle that takes place. It could be both. It could be either. It could be something totally different. All we know is what we have here. But here's what I do know. John focuses 
only on the outcome. He doesn't say a lot about the battle. His focus is on the beast and the false prophets, that they're disposed of, and the entire enemy army is killed. And will someone please say amen to that? Yeah. And I'll leave you with this. What is Jesus saying about himself to the church today? What's he revealing through this great revelation, through this one chapter that we've gone through this morning? Don't miss these. Write them down somewhere. Take a snapshot of the picture or something. First of all, Jesus is worthy of our praise. Jesus is worthy of our praise. The worship party we just saw in heaven, man, it's all about Jesus, as it should be. And I believe we're going to be there. We're going to be part of it. It's going to be a great thing. Number two, Jesus is the essence of prophecy. Jesus is the focus of all prophecy. Prophecy by design reveals the beauty and the loveliness of Jesus in everything, I believe. Number three, Jesus is faithful and true. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. We can trust Jesus. I mean, he's either sovereign over all or he's not sovereign at all. Jesus is faithful and true. And number four, the last one, the battle belongs to Jesus. That's true of this battle in Revelation 19. It's true of the battle that you're facing today. And let me tell you, everybody's facing a battle. Nobody gets a pass from that. The battle belongs to the Lord. Church, we've given ourselves to Jesus. We belong to him. We're his. So too are the battles that we face. We need to remember that today. Would you stand with me, please? I'm going to invite the worship team to come back on stage, and I'm going to pray for us. Father, thank you for this revelation of Jesus Christ, for revealing our Savior to us in such a clear, descriptive way. Lord, we thank you for the miraculous nature of it, everything that's contained in it, even for the way that you revealed it to John so he could reveal it to the church. Lord, I think it's a reminder to all of us that there are some challenging, trying, even dark days ahead of us. Some here this morning are facing a dark day right now. Lord, there's a major battle in their life. But Lord, help us to remember you were in absolute control. You have a plan and a purpose for everything and your plan for your kids is always good. You use all things together for good, Lord. And so we can find rest in you because the Lord God omnipotent reigns now and forever. Lord, I pray that you would fulfill your promise in our time. Bless all who have listened to this prophetic message this morning, those who obey what it says, for the time is near. It really is, Lord, the time is near. So we pray these things in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. amen.